so I've, I've read and heard that the vaccine includes cells from an aborted fetus and that this can alter my DNA. I've already been contacted to have the vaccine because I'm classed as extremely clinically vulnerable, but felt torn as I'm worried about long-term effects and these fetus cells. Can you explain how safe this vaccine is if you already have a have scarring on lungs and, and uh, from pneumonia and severe allergic asthma? And then someone's adding to this question um, that the gov.co.uk says the vaccine contains host host cell from human origin, HEK293, human embryonic kidney cell line. In addition, why does the vaccine have chimpanzee adenovirus vector? Apologies. Um, Brother Maseem, so can I, can, I, can I please answer this? So yeah, this no, do you want to do the first bit about the thing and then we'll... Yeah. Can, can, I, can I just finish reading so that I guess then you got oh, the... I add it all in, in one go then. So... um. So the, uh, the chimpanzee vector, which encodes the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And the final part is uh, Pfizer and Bono companies use the fetal cell line HEK293 uh, in the confirmation phase to ensure uh, the vaccines work. I don't know, maybe I can push down and that if you want. Just tell me you want All... to. Just to add to that. And fluid that. That's what Sorry, guys. Yeah? I don't know what's going on there. I'm just going to finish the final part of the question. Um, all HEK293 cells are descended from tissues taken from 19th century elective abortion that took place in the Netherlands. Uh, so I know there's a lot there. If you want me to go back to any part of that question, um, please, please let me know. Uh, but yeah, if you guys want to answer that one, if possible. So the question, I think that there are three main parts. There's fetal cells, there's chimpanzee virus, and then I'm clinically vulnerable. Can I have the vaccine? Okay. Yeah. yeah. The fetal cells, first of all. No, there are no fetal cells in the vaccine. And I can say this with confidence because we know exactly how the vaccine was developed and what's inside the vaccine when it's injected into you. That fetal cell has come from, so, so when you develop a vaccine, you have to do lots and lots of spot checks. You do those spot checks to make sure the vaccine is safe and to make sure it's going to work even before you inject it into a human being. And that's what the panels before they start a clinical trial say is okay to do. One of those spot checks that was done for the vaccine to test a part of it used copies of cells, not the actual cells, copies of cells from an aborted fetus in 1970. I'll just repeat that again. So one of the spot checks that was done to check the vaccine's safety used copies of cells from an aborted fetus in 1970. None of that makes it into the vaccine. OK, it, it's it's a spot check that's done for safety. And then what's actually produced in the vaccine doesn't have any of that. The ingredients that are in the vaccine are exactly what I showed you in the presentation. And you can see this in the ingredients list as well. The first that's the first thing. Chimpanzee virus. It's not a chimpanzee virus. It's it's called adenovirus and it's used as a platform to carry the information for, of COVID, the badge from the car, if, if you remember, to tell our immune system what it is. The reason it's called the chimpanzee virus is because chimpanzees or, or the ape population, us included, can have the virus, inactive virus, injected into us, and it will stay long enough for our immune system to actually read the COVID information but not long enough to cause any problems. So it's not from chimpanzees at all. It's grown in the lab. So that's where that comes from. We don't have chimpanzee viruses in, in, in the vaccine at all. If you are clinically vulnerable, then you should take this vaccine more than I should take this vaccine because this virus is much more dangerous to you than it is to me, even though I'm being black and ethnic minority background. The people who are dying from this virus are the clinically vulnerable and the people that need the protection of the vaccine are the clinically vulnerable. So if I was your doctor, I would be, I know it, the decision is yours, but if I was your doctor, I would be advising you to take the vaccine. Yeah, I, I just tag on to that in terms of, you know, my patients that I'm seeing, I'm sure what Dr. Nassim is seeing um, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, if you've got a lung condition that's causing, that's got scarring on the lungs, and my speciality in general practice is asthma and COPD. Um, you know, that puts you at a high risk of, if you caught COVID, of having an adverse outcome, you're more likely to go into hospital. You know, you're more likely to end up on a ventilator. 
compared to me who doesn't have any of those medical problems. It's all a relative risk, but, but that's why it's important for you to have the vaccine, to have those soldiers and those army and the shield, like Bernard spoke, spoke about in the presentation, so that when the virus does come into your body in the future, you've, you're ready, you've got an immune system, you've got a defense to fight that virus. Um, and coming to the severe allergic reaction, because yes, in the beginning, they were telling people not to have it when you have an allergy, but the current guidance is very clear. You know, if you've had uh, any allergies, that does not mean that you cannot have the vaccine at all. It's only if you've had a severe allergic reaction to an ingredient in, in the vaccine that's made you go to hospital or you needed an EpiPen. That's the only reason what, when, when allergies come into play. Having a medical allergy to medicines or having a food allergy does not mean that you cannot have the virus. If you are concerned or you are unsure, you speak to your GP or if you're invited to a vaccination hub, there is a dedicated doctor there who goes through these questions and any concerns they will, they will go through and do the checklist. Also, there's a fantastic web page called anaphylaxis.org.uk, which will answer quite a few of these common questions where people have asked them frequently, I have this kind of allergy, am I allowed to have the COVID vaccine? But for that specific question that, that, that I believe it was a sister who asked that question, sorry if I got that wrong, that I would say that no, you, you do not have any contraindications to this vaccine. Uh, can I just make an uh, add-on point there, Kasim? Yep. Uh, just from uh, anecdotally, what's, what's happened in one of my clinics, um, uh, a 75-year-old uh, lady turned up in my clinic and said that she had the polio vaccination when she was a child and developed, uh, I think, a, 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 a tummy pain uh, and a, 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 a bit of a fever afterwards. And her and she was told she had an allergy to to the to the polio vaccine, and so never had any vaccinations again. And she she declared this to me when I was about to inject her with the COVID vaccine. So a lot of people they get confused: what is an allergy, or what isn't an allergy? What is anaphylaxis or a serious allergic reaction, and what isn't? I think that the, the, the salient point and the key point you've made is severe anaphylaxis or severe allergy that's necessitated hospital admission is something we need to worry about. A stomach pain after, say, you know, a, a vaccination you've had, like a flu vaccination you've had, a low-grade fever you had, is not an allergy, and, and and that's really really important, I think, for your public. Thank you very much, guys. Um, <clears throat> a very detailed answer there. Um, Sheikh Sab wants to ask a question. Wants to mention something. Sorry. Sheikh Mansour has his hand up. Oh, sorry, I didn't say that. Sorry, Dr. Sheikh, Sheikh Mansour. Yeah, so I just I just want to um, add my comments on this um, human cell line. Uh, where does this question uh, comes from? So, uh, as as uh, the doctors, esteemed doctors here, have mentioned that there is no presence of human cell line um, in any forms or DNA in any of the um, vaccines, the COVID vaccines. Uh, nevertheless, one of the reasons why this question rises in people's mind is because previously, um, in previous vaccines, non-COVID related vaccines, such as chickenpox or shingles or um, rubella, Humal, human cell lines have been used. And these cell lines basically comes from cells from a woman by the name of Henrietta Lacks, who died in 1952, and also another anonymous uh, donor of aborted fetus in 1962 in Stockholm. Um, and these, uh, then the cell lines, W1 uh, cell lines were taken from the lungs of these aborted fetus and uh, they were then used in rubella, in chickenpox and in shingle vaccines. Now from a fatwa point of view, these cell lines, so it's not that they're killing babies OK, it's not the killing babies just to take uh, these cells. Uh, if you uh, for the non-medical profession, if you understand what a DNA is, what a, uh, what a cell is, if I was to give you an apple okay, and I had sweaty hands, the chances are and you were to eat that, the chances are that you will have my DNA and you will have my cells on that. So the ulama, they have mentioned, they've looked into this, specifically a mufti from um, Bradford, mufti Amjad Muhammad, has actually written a, a paper on this. And his conclusion is that the cell lines are so diluted 
you know, they're on the level of nanoparticles that we don't even consider that. We don't agree with the idea that babies were aborted back in 1962. But since uh, the cell lines have been made and it's so diluted that from an Islamic point of view, from a fatwa point of view, it's non-existent. So even, uh, um, you know, those vaccines which have been used, uh, cell lines have been used such as shingles, uh, rubella and chickenpox, from a fatwa point of view, it is permissible. I just wanted to add that. As far as the COVID vaccines are concerned, there's, it's, it's zero. There's nothing in there. Okay.